Happy New Year and Happy Holidays. My name is Caleb Maupin, and in light of some recent domestic and international developments, I thought that I might give a holiday message to young communists in the United States. So here goes. Charles Dickens began his novel, A Tale of Two Cities, with a line that was very famous. He wrote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Of course, he was referring to the French Revolution in that it was the best of times in that people were fighting back and overthrowing feudal aristocracies and declaring things like the rights of man, but it was also the worst of times because people were being executed and the reign of terror was happening. And a lot of violence was taking place and people were living in fear. Now, Charles Dickens was not a socialist, not a revolutionary, not a Marxist. He simply pointed out some of the problems of capitalism and morally critiqued them in his writings, books like Oliver Twist, A Christmas Carol, etc. However, that opening line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, seems to accurately describe the situation facing the United States right now for those of us who believe in socialism and Marxism. It's the best of times because our ideas are finally being taken seriously. Polls show overwhelmingly millions of young people in the United States believe in socialism. Bernie Sanders, a presidential candidate who professes openly to be a socialist, is getting millions of supporters. Uh, many people think he could very possibly win the Democratic nomination. The writings of Karl Marx are being taken seriously and discussed in ways they, they haven't been in this country in decades. The Cold War hostility to socialism is wearing off. And despite the fact that the right wing is in an anti-communist frenzy, accusing everyone left and right of being communists uh, and being Marxists, uh, Marxist ideas are, are being taken seriously and taken up by millions of young people in the United States. And that's a very, very good thing. Furthermore, around the world, uh, socialist countries uh, are on the rise. In Latin America, we've seen the rise of Bolivarian socialism. Um, you know, uh, despite attempts to overthrow the government of Venezuela, uh, it maintains its socialist government. Socialism with Chinese characteristics and its One Belt, One Road initiative is flourishing. All over the world, millions of people are studying Marxism and socialism. And in light of the collapse of global capitalism and the financial meltdown of 2008 from which the world has not recovered, we have seen a renewed interest in the struggle to build a society where the banks, factories, and industries operate for the benefit of the people. And society is no longer held back by the irrationality of greed and enabled to move forward and move ahead toward a more egalitarian vision of a society where everyone has what they need and coercion can gradually fade away. So in a way, you could argue this is the best of times. However, it's the worst of times. It's the worst of times because there was an ugly coup in Bolivia. It's the worst of times because of what's been done to the people of Syria and how the Syrians have faced a horrendous onslaught from forces determined to overthrow their government backed by the West. It's the worst of times as we face increasing hostility to Russia. It's the worst of times as the trade war with China has, has waged and had a huge economic toll. It's the worst of times as wages go down in the United States and the living standard drops. It's the worst of times as a police state is unfolding Police brutality continues. Uh, millions of people in the United States are incarcerated. It's the worst of times as we see an opioid epidemic claiming the lives of millions of working people. It's the worst of times uh, in the sense that, uh, that we're facing a crisis in the United States with sections of the ruling class fighting against each other and struggling for power. However, all of those things that we, as people who understand Marxism, as people who observe the political process, know very well, those are not the things I wanted to talk to you about. The purpose of this holiday New Year's message is to address the crisis within our very movement. Marxism in the United States is in a weird, weird situation. Never before in my lifetime really never before since the 1960s, have Marxist, socialist, and anti-capitalist ideas been so widespread among the U.S. public. Um, 
and they're spreading not among wealthy students who feel alienated, but rather among working people themselves, right? Working class people from places like Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Iowa and Wisconsin are seeing their communities destroyed by global capitalism. And as a result, they are tuning in, getting online, going to the libraries, reading up and finding out about Marxism. And while there are so many young people getting interested in Marxism, while socialist and communist ideas are growing, the communist groups in the United States, the various organizations that claim to be Marxist-Leninist vanguard parties, that claim to be revolutionary parties in the United States, are getting weaker and weaker and smaller. All right? Social democracy, democratic socialists of America is growing, and anti-capitalist sentiments are certainly growing. The internet is full of young tankies and young Marxists and young revolutionaries, but yet the various communist groups, the organizations that profess to be the vanguard parties that will lead the United States down the road to socialism, are getting weaker and smaller. Why is this happening? How can this be happening? In light of the capitalist crisis, in light of the changing international situation, you would think this would be the ideal moment for socialist and communist groups to spring up and flourish and build a base among the population and begin doing their best to move the country towards socialism. But the opposite is taking place. The groups are getting smaller, they're getting weaker, they're collapsing, they're splitting, they're falling apart among themselves. Why is this happening? I've spent a lot of time thinking about this as someone who has spent quite a long time in the Marxist movement in the United States, as someone who spends a long time researching and studying Marxism, as someone who's well known on YouTube and on social media for my Marxist commentaries. This is something that frankly keeps me up awake at night. Why is the Marxist movement so weak when socialism and anti-capitalist ideas are so strong? Well, the answer is this. If a young person, say a 20-year-old, were to join the Democratic Party, or the Republican Party, or the Libertarian Party, or the Green Party, and they were volunteering with one of these political parties, they were getting involved and being active, and they said to the leader of the Green Party, or, or some of the older folks in the Democratic Party, or the Republican Party, the Libertarian Party, you know, I would like to be president someday. Or, I would like to be on the national committee of the Democratic Party or the Libertarian Party or the Green Party or the Republican Party someday. I aspire to be on the national committee. I aspire to run for president. If you were to say that in any of the non-Marxist parties, the answer given to that young person would be, great, we're glad that you are so full of enthusiasm. We're glad that you are so full of ambition. We are glad that you have such aspirations welcome to our organization. They would be delighted to have a young person join their ranks who is full of energy and has big aspirations to carry it out, to, to achieve things in the political process. Any other organization would like that. However, if one were to join one of the various Marxist sects in the United States, one of the alphabet soup of parties, and were to say to them, you know, I hope to be on the national committee of this organization. I hope someday to run for president on this organization's platform. I would like to be a communist candidate for president. I would like to be on the national committee of this group. I would like to at some point become a national leader of this organization. The response that the young person would receive would be a cold one. Do you not trust our leadership? Do you not think you are better? Do you think you are better than the great leader who runs our group? Who do you think you are 
to be so arrogant to believe that you could possibly lead this group? Don't you understand how important the people at the top of our organization are? Are you trying to replace them? Are you trying to, to factionalize? No, 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 no. If you're the kind of person that has big aspirations in politics, if you're the kind of person who wants to lead this organization, you don't belong here in this group. No, 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 no. If you're arrogant, if, you're, if you think that you could amount to being something important, you don't belong in this organization. And that, that attitude toward a young person full of energy and potential and aspirations to build the socialist movement, that attitude where it is perceived as arrogance, where it's perceived as disrespect, where it's perceived as an affront to the old folks that have been presiding over these groups for decades and gradually watching them get smaller and smaller and smaller, that attitude points to the very problem of the communist movement in the United States. When Lenin formed the Party of New Type, the Vanguard Party, he went around to all the well-known, popular, well-respected Marxist leaders in Russia, Bukharin, Zinoviev, Trotsky, Stalin, Kamenev, Litvinov, he went to all of them and said, I would like you to be part of my new organization. And Lenin's brilliance was his ability to bring well-respected, capable, strong leaders into one organization. And democratic centralism was a necessity. It was a necessity. It was a way that all of these strongly opinionated, powerful, effective mass leaders could learn to coordinate their activities. Unity in action, while debate took place, keeping arguments internal. Democratic centralism was a necessity for having an organization with so many brilliant thinkers and revolutionaries in it. But today, in the United States, democratic centralism has turned into its opposite. Democratic centralism has essentially become a reason why there can be only be one smart person in each political organization, right? Democratic centralism has led to a million little sects that are grouped around one or two individuals. And if someone else comes into such a group and they're capable of speaking or capable of writing or capable of engaging and debating, if they're capable of actually getting things done in the mass movement, well, the leaders of this group deem them to be a threat and drive them out. And they have to then go form a new group. This is the opposite of what democratic centralism was when Lenin built the Bolshevik Party. But this is what it has become in the United States. These groups have basically uh, become entities that eat each other alive. They fight each other and they occupy a political space that is very, very far from average Americans. Most Americans have never met anyone from the SWP or the RCP or the ISO or the QWH or the XYZ. Most Americans have never encountered communists or socialists or Marxists and have frankly no idea what they argue. Meanwhile, these socialist, communist, and Marxist groups continue to fight amongst themselves, trying to prove to each other which is the most revolutionary. They accuse each other of being revisionists. They accuse each other of being sellouts. And why? Because the idea of being effective, the idea of convincing millions of Americans is something they've long given up on. It's not a question of actually getting anything done or actually winning people over. It's become a contest of who makes the most radical gestures, who beats their chest the loudest, who sounds the coolest, who can be the king of the protest cage. That is where the communist movement of the United States is at. However, the situation in the United States isn't getting any better. Wages are dropping. Automation threatens to take away millions of jobs. The low-wage police state is unfolding, and the international crisis with the One Belt, One Road Initiative, Bolivarianism, the rise of Russia, all of these things countering the power of Western capitalism are getting stronger. It is an absolute necessity right now that some kind of movement towards socialism begin to take place in the United States. However, in order for that to happen, the communist movement in the United States 
has to drastically change. We need a communist party in the United States or some kind of communist organization that will strive to bring people in to the political process, not stifle them. We need some kind of leftist or socialist movement in the United States where young people join and are encouraged and empowered and enabled to carry out their skills. Look, we know, we know what enemies of socialism will say in response to what I'm pointing out here. They'll say, well, of course, young people that join socialist groups are stifled. Of course, of course, their creativity is crushed because this is totalitarianism. This is Marxism. This is communism. This is what this is what evil Marxist Bolshevik regimes always do. They crush the individual initiative. But you and I know that's a lie. We know that in the 20th century, it was socialism that brought us the music of Shostakovich. It was socialism that invented the AK-47 rifle. It was socialism that allowed so much of the amazing creativity and high-tech invention that's taking place in China today to come into fruition. Furthermore, it was socialism that brought forth some of the greatest heroic leaders in history, people like Che Guevara, leaders who accomplished so much, were so brave. The socialist movement never was strong because it stifled people. It is only a statement about the irrelevancy and ineffectiveness of the sects that they have basically become almost an incarnation of the smears that anti-communists and anti-socialists have been spewing against our movement. And this is why it is so important. And let me emphasize this. It is so important that young people right now do not join and do not waste their time with one of these irrelevant, decaying sects. None of these groups are going to rebound. None of these groups are going to be suddenly rejuvenated and turned into healthy organizations. These are groups that have become more and more unhealthy and ineffective and more and more isolated from the masses over the course of the last several decades. What's needed now more than anything is for young people to start engaging with these ideas in a new way. Start questioning old concepts. And that is what I am trying to facilitate on my YouTube channel and with the discussions I do, whether it's the YouTube Lives every week, with the, whether it's the political events that I've staged around the country where I've given presentations. We need a new conversation about socialism. We need to figure out how to get out of the movement and get to the masses. That is absolutely needed. I've written a book, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, and there is a companion volume, a new book that is also in the works, trying to facilitate these conversations, putting forward my understanding of the problems we are facing as a movement. However, I'm just one guy. I need you. I need you to get involved. I don't need you to join one of these small groups and, and become a cadre in one of these decaying organizations that will stifle you and crush you. I need you to come along with me, even if you don't agree with me. I need you to get on board with the project that is going on right now. We need to facilitate dialogue about how the socialist and Marxist movement in the United States can get out of this rut. Because the only way out of the unfolding low-wage police state of decay and poverty and the danger of a new world war, the only way out of it is movement towards socialism. And I can guarantee you that none, none of the existing parties are going to successfully move the country towards socialism. They all are bogged down in the errors and trauma and pain of, of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union. We need a new conversation. And that is what I am trying to facilitate on this YouTube channel. So I hope you will walk the revolutionary road with me. I hope that when you disagree with me, you will say so. I hope that when you agree with me, you'll say so. I hope you'll build this community. I hope you'll bring people on board. We have to facilitate a new conversation about how we can get the United States on the road to socialism. And as I have said many times, if you disagree with me, please outdo me. Make videos yourself. Make your own videos. Do it better than me. Outdo me. That is my challenge to my critics. I know not everyone agrees with everything I say. Outdo me, please. Do a better job than I am. I'm just one guy. I'm just one guy, but I'm part of a growing community.
I've met many of you. And knowing some of the people who've reached out to me in the last year or so has really made me very happy and given me a lot of hope. I have hope because almost every couple weeks I'm contacted by two, three, four new young people who didn't come from a communist background, didn't come from a communist family, but really want the United States to get out of this crisis.